Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Hi there. Welcome to the Kate Daly Show. Glad you're with us today. The time is 2.07. Can you believe it? Is this day skipping along or what? Happy Tuesday to you. And of course, the theme brought to us by those great guys at Dixie Power. And when I say guys, I mean gals too. Come on. <laughs> mean them all. Uh, but the guys at Dixie Power, they're great. They're fantastic. Become a member and start saving today. They're fantastic. Anyway, uh, the great sponsor of the show, got to mention them because they're that good. Uh, piano Gallery Music at 144 West Brigham Road, just off the Bloomington exit behind Zion's Bank. A piano would make a perfect addition to any home. You just call John or Jamie. And by the way, the Parade of Homes, get your tickets. Uh, you still have a little time, right? And it's utahparade.com. Get those tickets and uh, look at those houses. I think they're they're absolutely gorgeous. You can get some great ideas. And the Prey to Homes is always a uh, a great, I don't know, they're just phenomenal. Are they not? I, every time I walk away, just blown away. So anyways, go over there. Ah, Randall Hinton and Thomas Dykes from Pyrolytical Radio. How are you guys? We're doing good. Glad to be here. Yeah? It's fun to be here. I'm glad to have both of you here. This is fun. It's the trifecta. Yeah. <laughs> the triforce. We're here. It is. It's like, I, I always look forward to these two hours with you guys because I'm always... I always want to know where we're going to go and where we're going to end up. What's the end game of the show? Me and too. I never know where it's going to go. But uh, we're going to actually tape today. We're taping today. Yeah. And that'll be available. And you guys will be able to see the uh, inner workings, how exciting that is of radio. The sanct inner sanctum. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the inner sanctum. Uh, but uh, I sure appreciate you guys being here. We have so much to talk about. There's so much in the headlines. That really we could go over. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that there are um, obviously certain things going on in with uh, our parental rights in Utah that really need addressing. Am I right? I, it totally. just seems to me like we're being hit every single day on parental rights in this country, uh, let alone Utah. What are you guys thinking? Well, I, I told Randall about your story last week when you told your son to walk out of school. Mm -hmm. uh, I did, because they were telling him he had to take the Common Core test. And I'm thinking, uh, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Not on my watch. I'm his right. parent. And I said, no. You're the boss. I'm the boss. I'm the parent, right? You're the boss of the school system, too, by the go. way. You know, it, it's interesting, though, because it wasn't too long ago <clears throat> that the parents were, you know, the one, they were the mm -hmm. ultimate say. Right. But now you've had so many years of all these people of higher learning and education, they understand better than a parent how to take care of a child mm -hmm. and um, they understand what's right. So therefore you as a parent, you are, you're a stakeholder, but you're not, you're not the ultimate say. That's a great point. That's a great point. That's at least a weird that's the way phrase. they look at it. They yeah. use that phrase too in their marketing or in their bylaws or whatever, the stakeholders. Yeah. <laughs> and, and our, our friend Heather Gardner, she gave a speech at the Utah State Office of Education Mm -hmm. And she says, I'm not a stakeholder, I'm a parent. She specifically targeted that phrase. I like that. Good on her. I, you know, I think that uh, right now we're in a situation where we find ourselves fighting for our rights. I don't think we even thought we'd be here 20 years ago no. trying to tell the state where they should land and where a parent's jurisdiction is. And I would have thought 20 years ago we wouldn't be having to say to the state of Utah or our, or our federal government that we have a right in our kids' lives um, as the stakeholder. <laughs> as, <laughs> primary. As primary. the primary stakeholder in our kids' lives. I, I'm surprised that we're having to do this. I really am. For some reason, it catches me off guard because you see the cases. You see the girl having to take chemo. You see the cases medically that are happening. You see the cases in, in now our educational system. And a good friend of the show, Trevor, had written in and said, look, you know, my, the kids at my, my kids' schools were told while taking the Common Core test, if they had one little peep, they were going to be suspended from school. I mean, this is, this is an authoritarian sort of... Uh, it's just strange to see the schools react like this, and it's become, it's it's ramping up from what I can tell. It's ramping up, and it's becoming a situation that it's making parents very, very afraid for what's next on the horizon if it could ramp up this much within the last year and a half. Well, right. Ms. Gardner was told by the school board her kids weren't welcome back in the school, her two children, unless she would submit to having them take the test. So I'm like, well, that's a little adversarial for your local neighbor's 
that our teachers and educators, the federal government's now pitted you against or pitted them against the parent. That's pretty strange to me. I agree. I agree. And that article on her was fabulous. By the way, she called, she uh, emailed me and I'd like to have her on the show. She's phenomenal that she could stand up the way she has. The article was very descriptive in its view on Common Core and what's really happening and even going down the tests, the tests that the kids are having to take. And what's really strange is, is the parents have to be so diligent in this that we actually have to say to the schools, you cannot decipher which tests they take and which they don't. We get a say in this. We tell you what we want them to take. You're not telling us what they're going to be doing. Let's take the caller. Hi, caller. Welcome to the show. Hi, Kate. Hi there. Uh, I hate to make you change gears a little bit, but I <laughs> no, you try don't. To get to this for a couple <laughs> What's <days>. up? What's <laughs> up? You know, I, I would like to uh, get a recall campaign going on Mayor Pike. Really? How come? Yeah, I'll tell you. Because anybody who has so little respect for the people of St. George that he would make a statement like. I received three phone calls in favor of keeping the sun ball. Mm-hmm. And that says a lot. Hmm. It doesn't say a lot to me. <laughs> okay. Well, and uh, if he thinks we're that stupid that he can spit something like that out mm-hmm. and have us just say, oh, okay, spend all the money you want, Mayor Pike, on saving the sun ball. You had three phone calls. I mean... No, you what make else a good needs point. to be said? You make a good point. What would you like to have happen to the summer? I don't think any money should be spent on it. What if we had people in the community spend money on it rather than the government? Oh, that's fine. That's okay. fine. I don't think any tax dollars controlled by the city government should be spent on it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I'm with you on that. I don't think that we should be spending money as a government on, on the Sun Bowl. I think this should come well, from, from people. You know, we can, we say these things now and we're more and more people are speaking out, mm-hmm. but I, I felt the same way about the rap tax and I felt the same way about this uh, thing they're doing over at Tana Quint. I, you know, I just can't, I drive by there every day. I just can't wait to see how little that part for disabled people is used. Hmm. You mean and the- I, I'm willing to bet that it barely gets used. Really? Okay. I, yep. I, I, don't, I think it'll get used more than that, but I'd like to see it have more donations. I'd like to see the people build that park because it is more expensive. And when, when they were talking about some of the rides and the things that they want to have there, I thought they don't need all of that. That's way overdoing it. Anyway. Well, it's, Typical government, they way <laughs> overdo everything because they don't have to answer to anybody for the money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you bring up you bring up a solid point. But uh, I'm, I, I think if he has that little respect for me that he can make a statement like that, I, I think we should get rid of him now. And I think it would send a, I think it would become nationwide news if we recalled Mayor Pike, and it took off across the country. Wow. I know I haven't seen a decision made. And I'm not quite sure what statement you're talking about, so I'll have to look into that. Well, I don't know about a, a recall quote over out of that. This newspaper article on the front page on Sunday. Hmm. Okay. I just I'm not so, sure about a recall over that. I'm not. It's I, not over that. It's over the fact that he has so little respect for our intelligence. Hmm. That's what it's about. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to see your, your, your side. Okay. We'll have to talk about this further too. Um, we'll, I'll have to look into it a little bit more. All right. Hey, sounds good. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Appreciate right. that. All right. You know, it's funny. It's always a fight, isn't it? In little tiny increments right. for our rights. It's never a full blown, um, big, huge, uh, scale, uh, event. It's always in little tiny increments increments. It's like eating the whale. You just do it one bite at a time. And that's what I feel like the government's doing to us all the time. It's, it's interesting to watch because I think if you step away from politics or you step away from the issues for five years, what are you going to see? I remember when I left, um, I left on an LDS mission and I came home after not looking at Cosmo for 18 (laughs) months. Right. And I came home and I read that horrible magazine. (laughs) It is. It's just horrible. But anyway, I came home and I picked up a Cosmo and I hadn't seen it, obviously, 18 months or more. Right. And I come home and I'm in my 20s and I had I used to pick it up all the time. And I, I literally sat it down and was 
dumbfounded at the stuff they could put in just in the 18 months I was gone. Because it's like the frog in the, in the proverbial boiling water. You don't see it as it's happening. And that's what's going on with our parental rights, too. I didn't see. I didn't notice. But when I came home from being 18 months without TV and movies, I remember Pretty Woman was out. And uh, the TV shows got worse. And Cosmo was saying things that I couldn't even believe they were actually in print. And it wasn't like Penthouse I was reading. So it was, it was interesting to me, <laughs> the, the differences. And I think if you stepped away for five years, in five years, right now, you'd be astounded at how many liberties are taken away from us in the next five years in little tiny bites. Well, I I was thinking the, the, I call it state creep. Mm. It's the, the momentum that the state has once it puts something into place. Like the only reason common core is an issue is because the U S department of education was put in, in the late seventies. The only reason that we have an issue with Obamacare is because Medicare was put in the 60s. So once they get a foothold on our liberties and they promise us benefits, like what was the promise, the benefit that the U.S. Department of Education would give? The same one they're promising now is a raising of the standards of education. Our kids will be more educated. They'll right. be better for it. Right? And look, and look how much animosity there is now yeah. in the education system between parents and teachers. No, you're That's absolutely what we right. Got. It's like in- income tax. It was only supposed to be to the top 3%, right? Then when it... So, went, yeah, it, and that, what, well, that yeah, only 3%. took, what, two years? Yeah. And then it, and then it jumped down. Right. Yeah, but and there was a war, so, you yeah. know. <clears throat> and well, just, if it's good enough for the top, then it right. should be good enough for the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the, the yeah, top find a way out of it with their... Their family trusts and their lawyers and, and, and overseas, they place their operations. So right. the, the small, the lower classes always get hit with the income right. tax. The middle class. Right. If yeah. I was rich, that's what I would do. I would find a way out of it. Yeah, hide it all. Sure. Even if Why I was not? a good person, I would still try to get out of that. So. Right. Well, well, because you'd have the natural understanding that you probably have a better, better use of that money than, than just whatever bureaucrat has a hold of it. Remember the parable of the pool that you did several uh-huh. years ago? You want to explain that? It's Ooh, pretty let's fascinating. Let's see if I'm I can remember I'm putting you on the spot. It it's been a while. Um, well, there's a swimming pool. Yes, yeah, so you got the swimming pool, <laughs> and everybody's a part of the pool because it's mm-hmm. the economy, right? right? Everybody's part of it. And so the government says, well, we're going to take from this end, the deep part, mm-hmm. we're going to dip out of it, and we're going to dump it back so it goes back in the smaller part okay. or the lower part. The lower income. Part. And what happens to the water? Well... It all evens out, right? right? right. We're going to dump it back in. The only only problem is when they dump it, they don't dump it right back in the pool. They dump it in the flowers by the side, and there's a little hose that dribbles it back in. Meanwhile, gotcha. it gets absorbed mm-hmm. in, uh, I don't know, they're probably weeds, not flowers. Uh, yeah, anyway, that's, that's on the, which side of the, equation, the brief you know? on that mm-hmm. one. But but ultimately, you know, if, you, if you're going to tax, you know, corporations and individuals, those taxes are going to be felt by the lower... Income Absolutely. brackets because you know you tax Walmart. Walmart's going to pass along taxes because they're in the business of making money, not being a charity. Yep, it's and it is it is the trickle down effect. When you talk about that, it is trickling down to everybody. But the the middle class seems to get hit no matter who's getting hit. Absolutely right. You know we're always getting the shaft, and so um, I look at income tax. I look at all the things you guys mentioned, and it, it doesn't matter. It, it just seems as though. If you are not standing up and trying to at least fight or be aware of what's going on, you're lost in the mix. I mean, you don't even understand really anything. I mean, I understand this because as a mom raising kids, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't informed. I knew what was going on because I watched the regular media, <laughs> right? <laughs> whatever you want to say about that, uh, that narrative. But I thought I was informed. Oh, heavens. I, I, did, I didn't even, <laughs> I didn't even see any of this. And so I look at, I look at how ill informed people are right now and how much they don't care. And then I see an uprising of people that do care all of a sudden and they're getting younger, which is surprising. Well, the, the interesting thing is I would, when the caller was on mm-hmm. talking about mayor Pike, um, that's basically exactly what was going through my mind about the media. And here, um, this report that he read was on the front page of the spectrum. So you have a comment from him that's quoted in the spectrum, but you don't have context with that. You have whatever context that the spectrum or whatever media outlet has decided to give the reader or the viewer or whatever. So it's, it's biased. It's yeah. a bias. That's true. Now, not saying that, that Mayor Pike is without blame or Mm -hmm. or that he's off the hook but it's just saying like that it's it's really tough to try and say well let's 
um, let's go back and, and recall him because of what mm-hmm. was quoted in yeah, an article. Yeah, I have article, a hard time with that. I, um, versus saying, hey, let's, let's first start a dialogue mm-hmm. with Mayor Pike and say, hey, we've got an issue. The spectrum said this. What did you really mean, first right. off? And then let's have a conversation about what's going on with the no, sun I bowl. like that. And then don't take the spectrum verbatim. Don't take one comment and say that, that is, that's the entire issue. And I know this caller uh, probably wouldn't do that. So I'm, I'm actually surprised at that. But I'll look into it more. And so will you. You know, we'll yeah. look into it more and, and kind of get to the bottom of it. Because I can see how somebody would be offended. You know, <laughs> this, you, know you, you get three phone calls and you make a decision. Obviously, with our taxpayer dollars, nobody wants to see that. But on the other flip of the coin, what's really going on, too? Is there another yeah. side of the story? What, what, what's going on behind the scenes that you don't see? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, we need to hold our elected representatives accountable. Mm-hmm. But I think what we, one of the biggest problems we have in government as a whole is our inability. I mean, things are so fast and they're so busy. I mean, we have thousands of bills that go through Washington, D.C. every year, tens of thousands of bills. We have hundreds, if not more, that, well, 500 new laws every year or whatnot mm-hmm. that happen at, at the state capitol, and they've only got 45 days to go through everything. So things happen so quick. And we don't take the time to talk and understand and learn and listen. That's Mm -hmm. that's lost from the discussion. Here's a counter to that. Okay, Okay, legislators have 45 days. Utahns and the American people have the rest of the year. So they should be educated before legislators even think about touching bills or proposing them. Mm -hmm. They should already know what the principled position is. Mm -hmm. And we also need to look at the parties that are advocating for these solutions, so-called, to, like, say, education. Well... I, I did some research. Governor Herbert's a member of the U.S. Governors Association. He's the vice chair. This organization has received millions of dollars from the Gates Foundation. And I found that any organization that advocates for Common Core has received money from the Gates Foundation. To me, that's a, a conflict of interest of fundamental proportions. I heard your show, Kate, with mm-hmm. Don Fortheringham. Mm-hmm. I think that's his name, a few right. weeks ago. Makers. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how these... these uh, Billionaires and millionaires have bought up Time Magazine and other mm-hmm. media outlets so that they could put forth their ideas. And they're also the ones selling the idea of an income tax would soak the rich. And so when you have people proposing the very solutions that they're going to implement, you probably need to look at that and yeah. say, okay, there's the problem. Yeah. Well, well, you know, they would be in favor of it, obviously, because it benefits them, but they shouldn't be the sole voice. Yep. There should be other people that aren't economically connected that also say, yeah, this is a good idea. But if it's just the people that, you know, are going to benefit from mm-hmm. it or, or this is our, our motive, well, then maybe you should take a, a second look at it. <laughs> right. I mean, I look at Common Core and I think, what were we told? This is what we were told. Our kids are dumb. They need to be smarter. So the government, <laughs> and we all know the serious. government can People fix that. People actually believe this. So the government's going to come in and they're going to set standards so that our kids are smarter. So they do better. So we can compete with China, even though China wants to compete with us now, right. by the way, um, because they lost their creativity in the mix, but that's a whole nother show. <laughs> so, so you have common core and you have the reasons behind it. And what's very interesting to me is there are parents out there who think, well, they've told us our kids are dumb. So if you don't like Common Core, your kids are probably too dumb to take the test because my kids are doing great. They don't even question the legality of it. They don't question the state using monies for this that they're not supposed to use because we're not supposed to have a federal curriculum and they're using the money for it, for yep. state money. Right. Okay. They don't question the constitutionality of it. Nothing. It's well, your kids, <laughs> your kids must be dumb because you want to take them out of the test. Well, my kids are so smart. I want them in the test so they can help improve other kids. I can't believe this narrative. I can't believe people actually say this with a straight face. But do you know how many parents out there, I would say a vast majority of them with their kids in Common Core, think this? Well, how they many, do. They how many kids are in the public education system? If you're going to set a standard for every kid in America, we're talking, what, 100 million kids or more? Mm-hmm. Number one, the hubris of people who think that they can organize spontaneous <laughs> order. And, and if you're going to set a standard for that, and I watched a bunch of experts today talk about this, the standard will get lower and lower because the two goals that are stated by Arne Duncan and others in the Education Association is that they want to have career readiness and college readiness. So how do you fundamentally create a standard that will apply to everyone in every possible career path and in college? You have to dumb down everything because there's no way that the a lot of kids are going to hit that. The lowest common denominator, right? Yeah. You have to go to the lowest common denominator. Right. Um, but 
I think that parents should be questioning the legality and the constitutionality of this. They don't even care. They don't care because the government says it's okay. Well, it's interesting because the whole the whole idea of standardized testing in mm-hmm. general, you know, has created this very interesting economic phenomenon if you if you want mm-hmm. to look at it that way in schooling, which is that you know, teachers, especially now, you know, they're looking at, you know, merit mm-hmm. pay for for teachers based on these sort of results, right? right? How they do. But even before that, it was it was a status symbol. My class did great. We did, you know, 20% higher than the rest of the third graders or whatever, you know, and it was, it was a status symbol. And so teachers, you know, even from the beginning of this have further and further along the line taught for excellence on the test rather than excellence in education. Right. So education is lost with the perceived result of getting great test results, but Test results don't equal real world education. They equal test results. Bingo. Bingo. And, and as long yeah. as we're willing to just continue to buy in that, then we will we will continue to see education decline in the United States no matter how many tests we throw at it. Right. Well, I there was a survey by the National Education Association last November and it said that nearly half of all teachers have considered quitting because of standardized testing. And almost three quarters of teachers in the survey reported feeling moderate or extreme pressure from administrators to improve test scores because (laughs) funding is tied to test scores. You think I give a rip two cents about what some federal bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. thinks about my kids' standards? I could care less. One thing we don't teach in schools nowadays is entrepreneurialism. They're taught get good grades, pass the test, go to college. I mean, I'm going to college now and I'm 41 years old. Why did I wait so long? Mm -hmm. I didn't have the discipline and I didn't have a need for it. Now I'm getting a marketing degree because that's what I do. But see, I waited on my career path to take education when I actually needed it. Do you need it? Do you need a degree to do it, what you're doing? It, it's nice. I'm learning things. Okay. But I'm, but I'm going to have to pay for that. And so the, I didn't go to college. I couldn't stand it. Well, neither did Steve Jobs, who <laughs> you played I earlier. I couldn't stand it. He I, dropped I, you out of college. I was bored stiff. I could not. I couldn't even stay awake in class. I, I just thought this is this the most is my third thing. attempt. Really? Seriously, I take one class and I'm like, oh, I hate college. <laughs> I do. I hate it. But but my kids, I mean, I see the effect on their lives. They do not like school just because it's test, test, test. That's all we do. We do two to three hours of homework a night, right. and then they study for tests. And now that Common Core is three times a year in a lot of schools, you got the beginning, interim, and the end, that's, that's so much of the effort and energy is, is focused on creating standards for mm-hmm. our kids that the federal government approves of. There's no local control there. Well, it's you know, ridiculous. It, it's interesting, and I don't know how much testing specifically is a part of this, but you take the average kindergartner, mm-hmm. they're so excited about school. They're so right. excited to go and learn, and they just absorb it, and it's amazing and you get a first grader, and they still are, but not the same degree. And then True. a second grader, and it's less and less. And by the time they get up into middle school and high school, they're just like, "I gotta go to school. I don't want to be here." Isn't Actually, the they but do I gotta that go to school. I gotta read. I gotta read a book. You know what? I have to talk my son into going. My twelve-year-old. You know why? Because in science, they don't do any application this year uh, for him. They haven't done any application. It's all book work. Yeah. And I, I sat there and I felt really sad for him because I thought, you know, it, it, what kid doesn't want to at least see a, uh, whatchamacallit, Alka-Seltzer in a, in a Coke bottle <laughs> and the Coke shoot through the roof? Mentos. Who does not? <laughs> Mentos. <laughs> this is a chemical reaction in action. <laughs> I don't care how lame it is. It's cool. And the kids aren't being able to see anything. There's no science. It's all book work. And it's all computer uh, book work, if you will. All these tests are on the computer. And he said, I have to do like 80 things on the computer. He said, this is boring. I don't even like science. He's getting a D right now. Mm. He hates it. And he said, there's nothing cool to watch. He said, it's just all just book work. And my kids are coming home consistently and telling me this. It's, it's not just science. It's the other classes, too. And they're missing out. What's so interesting to me is are two things uh, globally. Number one, China is trying to find out why our kids are so creative. What happened to their <laughs> kids? So their kids are very smart, but not creative. We come up with the ingenuity. We have the entrepreneurs over here. So they're actually changing to be more like us as we're changing to be more like them. It's ridiculous. And then you have Finland, who it was excellent. They're excellent in their understanding of children. Their recesses are 45 minutes long. They have multiple 
recesses throughout the day. The kids go out and play, right? And also because their test scores are high because they don't test very much. They teach all year and then they they test at the end of the year. Don't you remember us going through this very same thing? I remember finals being at the end of the year. Our kids have finals every week. Can you even imagine what that's like? So I look at Finland and I say, you know what? They're onto something. I read an article, pjmedia.com. They're they're an interesting site, but uh, they had an article on there. Uh, that was talking about the nearsightedness of young Chinese students. And they said it's because they're in front of a screen 24-7 from the time they're born. And it's causing nearsightedness at a a record point that these kids are 85% needing glasses early on. Optometrists love this problem. Oh my gosh, because we are creating this huge (laughs) issue by putting them in front of screens. What is common core testing? It's on screens. Online. It's all yeah. on screens. And I think we are missing out. We're missing out on so much, so many things that these kids need to learn in the way they need to learn them. And we need to respect their ability to have recess and play. This is what makes kids want to learn. It's their ability to marry education and making learning fun with play. Well, how, yeah. But we the, strip them of that. The relevancy factor is a problem. Like kids are like, how is this relevant? Why do I, why do I need this? And I know I noticed with my three kids and it was like clockwork. They loved kindergarten because they're, I think kindergarten or teachers have some freedom there. Mm-hmm. They all hated first grade. There was this a serious demeanor change in their first grade. Yeah. They just started to not like school from, from the very first grade on. And, mm-hmm. and I thought there, there's something there to that. You make an excellent point. I had somebody email me. I get a lot of emails. You're welcome to email me too. Kate at canyonmedia.net. Go ahead and email me your questions or concerns. Um, not just about Sage, but everything. This, this call, <laughs> this everything, why not? Even the theory of life, I don't care. Um, but I got this uh, one Next email. <laughs> this one email that was talking about, I have a third grade, a second grader. And I thought Sage testing didn't start till the third grade. And they were a little confused by this because they were starting these tests and the kid didn't want to go to school. And uh, come to find out, they're doing all the pre-testing for SAGE because Mm. they just can't get enough. So instead of starting in third grade, now they're doing all the pre-testing in first and second just to drive our kids a little more For what? What Uh, is the point of behavioral tests that goes to some data collection agency that's fed to the federal government? There's a purpose to spend millions and millions of dollars and control America's education system. And unless you really don't believe in conspiracies of any kind from this government, there's something nefarious about that. And if three-fourths of our teachers, as according to the NEA, said they feel uh, moderate or extreme pressure from administrators to improve test scores, they don't speak out. We don't get calls from teachers. I agree. I agree. No, they're their own lobby. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We'll be right back. Stay tuned. We have more where that came from. Interstate Battery, go to... Right here on Fox News Radio, 1450 AM and 93.1 FM, KCNU. Let the good times roll. This is how she is. Let them make you a clown. 